I'm here um, on behalf of CrowdCover for a project called Moabi. I'm co-presenting with Elizabeth McCarthy from McCartney from the USGS. We're talking about OpenStreetMap as infrastructure. And what the heck do we mean as OSM as infrastructure? We start with recognizing that OpenStreetMap is the most successful, insanely successful project for massive geodata collaboration around. And there must be something encoded in, certainly in the community process, but also in the code of the OpenStreetMap website and the rest of the ecosystem of OpenStreetMap tools, which powers that, which makes that possible. And there are other data sets out there I've come to recognize um, that have needs for geodata collaboration. But um, when you go to look at the options out there, there's nothing that quite makes it as easy to have conversations about, to collaborate about, to maintain geographic data collectively as OSM. When I first started thinking about this, I definitely had to sanity check the idea with many people to make sure I wasn't seeing a hammer for every nail out there. And I'm pretty sure it's the right hammer for this nail of other data um, using the same infrastructure. And we benefit from an amazing, as we've seen this weekend, uh, open source community, lots of activity, lots of development. And it's, it's a lot of fun to work within this code base for other purposes. So we have two case studies. Uh, we'll start with the USGS National Map Core. Um, and we're going to take five parts to each case study. What's the motivation for looking at OpenStreetMap as infrastructure? What kind of community, who are the users, and what are their motivations for working with data within our projects? What kinds of adaptations and customizations have we had to make to the OpenStreetMap toolset to enable that? Um, what is the point? What are we publishing? What are we getting out into the world at the end of all of this work on data? And then finally, some of the results from, from these uh, uh, projects and lessons and ideas for what can happen in the future with OpenStreetMap infrastructure. So I will turn it over to Elizabeth for the National Map Corps. Thank you. Happy to hear, I'm happy to see that we have such a good group, you know, starting to get a little bit later in the afternoon. Um, the National Map Corps has been around for just a, a couple of years, but the VGI has been around the USGS for quite a while, in fact, since about 1994. We have a small team, and so as we start talking about the resources, that's one of the things that, that is driving um, our use of uh, OpenStreetMap infrastructure. So a history of VGI at the USGS it began in, in, as a quad in 1994, and some of you might remember that. You actually adopted a quadrangle. You checked out a quadrangle. You have it for about 12 months. Um, that's when we would want it to come back. And you just wrote on it and, you know, did your, your uh, annotations. And so it was pretty cumbersome and it was kind of frustrating for some of the users. If you picked a quad that was in, in quite a developed area, that's a lot of work to do. In 2001, they started using, um, collecting structures using the GPS units, as GPS units became more affordable. I think I got one for Christmas in 2000. I think that was my first one. Uh, Web-based structures collection in 2006, and then in 2008, the program was suspended. There's a lot of reasons for that. It took a lot of resources to get that information we were getting from our volunteers, and we had quite a few volunteers. It's nothing on the scale of OpenStreetMap, but, you know, over 3,000 volunteers just for the paper maps, and, and um, we had 400. I think there were you know, quite a few more is using the GPS. But we were getting things in from email, from spreadsheets, from Excel. And so to take that information and be able to bring it into our databases, it took a lot of resources at the USGS. And as money became, got tighter and tighter, that program was suspended. And, and then OpenStreetMap happened. And the success of OpenStreetMap, and it was well known. They had the, the um, so we were taking another look. And that was the, the revival of VGI at the USGS. In 2010, we had a workshop and a pilot project. 
collecting roads in Kansas. We, we started with GIS professionals. Our volunteers were GIS professionals. In 2011, and it was transportation data, and as you know, it's a lot more complicated than structure points. And in 2011, we had a, a second pilot project, and we used students at the universities of four quadrangles over the Denver metro area. And so they were GIS students. Um, they got some credit for it in their class, and they got certificates, and we learned a lot, and we were able to really um, focus on our documentation, on our training, and um, our enhancements to potlatch. In 2012, we opened it up to the entire state of Colorado, and then last year in April, we started expanding to all 50 states, and by August of last year, all 50 states are available for editing. What we are editing, well, let me look at the, we'll talk about the workflow real quick. Well, we're editing 10 only 10 structures, so we decided to simplify from that transportation data. But this is our workflow. The editor, which is Potlatch 2, um, a modified version of it, is loaded, is preloaded with data from the National Structures Program. And then in the middle, what you see are the editors get a hold of it, our volunteers, and these are true volunteers we have that come from all, all over the place. And um, the basic editors, they edit. After they have edited over 25 points, they're allowed to be peer reviewers. It's an automatic bump. So we have roles that we use. And on top of that, the USGS QA, so we take a look and we are you know, taking a peek at things to make sure everything looks okay uh, on a regular basis. And once the edits have been done, so everything is edited on that first phase, everything is looked at, is peer reviewed by a second volunteer in, in that second phase. And then the USGS does, we do our own QA. And then the data are moved back into the structures data program. It goes to the na national map. It's available as soon as it's loaded into the structures data program. Um, there's, there is a lag, there's a lag, and it's not immediate like OpenStreetMap, and, and hopefully sometime we'll be able to, to remedy that, but there is some lag there, but hopefully it'll be within three to six months people can see what they've done on the national map viewer, and then our three-year cycle for our U.S. Topo product, and I was listening to a, um, a talk earlier, and we were talking about, you know, old maps, and we were pretty much king of old maps there for a while. I, if you lived in a rural area, you had maps that were 40 or 50 years old. And I remember because I work at the what used to be the Mid-Continent Mapping Center in Rolla, Missouri, and I was selling 40-year-old maps to people walking in off the street. So it's nice. We're in a three-year cycle based on the NAEP photography, and, and that's helpful. Um, but our volunteers have a lot to do with updating that structures part of the U.S. Topo product. So these are the 10 structures that we collect. These are the 10 structures that are part of the national map and, and the US topo right now. Um, hope, we're hoping to expand that a little bit, but we'll see how that goes. The expansion to all 50 states, again, was in April of last year. And I don't know what the date is. Oh, that's February 17th for this map. So you can kind of see where people are, are uh, doing the edits. Our volunteers, Girl Scouts, retirees, 4-H, we have a, a good relationship with 4-H. Um, the Boy Scouts also, and you know anybody who wants to sign up, so it's similar to OpenStreetMap, uh, you just register. We are working on some gamification techniques just to make things fun, and we're trying to capitalize on some of the things built in um, to the OpenStreetMap infrastructure too, but in addition we have volunteer recognition badges based on some antique surveying equipment, and that's just kind of fun. And then we tweet out people's names and we put, you know, put them on the USGS Facebook. And the back end, and this is not, this is not my area of expertise, but I know that Jimmy McAndrew is in the audience, so we have questions on that. He'll know more, and he's also part of his presentation following this one. He'll talk a little bit more. He's doing a similar project at the National Park Service. So the Linux server, and then the four, four projects. Navigator is the website itself with the user management. Um, and we have several potlatch editors, so we use different editors based on the roles that somebody is given. And we have a custom tile caching service. 
and we use Confluence for our web help, and I'm, I'm not really happy with that. If, if there's anybody there that knows how to customize it so it's a lot slicker, that would be great. But it works and it's cheap, so, you know, that's what we're using. And this is the Rails view, along with the, uh, the layers that are available. Um, you'll see there's some Alaska community photos there, so we have some issues with imagery for Alaska. Okay. And um, so what we have are snapshots of communities, so you really have to zoom in to your community. So if you go to Wales, Alaska, for instance, and zoom all the way in, then you can see that community photo. And our Twitter, we have a Twitter feed. So that's some of the customizations. And then you can see the Potlatch 2 editors. Um, the standard editor, everybody is invited. Um, peer review, once you hit, once you've edited 25 points, then that tab will appear. And so you also get an email inviting you to be a peer reviewer. An advanced editor is an, an advanced role that we're testing for users that have about 200 points under their belt, so they're more experienced. And we would allow, we, our thought is, is that their contributions would not have to be peer reviewed they'll still go through a light QA process, and we QA them all before they're given that role. Oh, the trails also, well, that, I just popped that one off, but we have a trails editor that we're looking at for a um, pilot project soon. And these are the base layers for the Potlatch 2 editors, aerial imagery, the national map base layer, everything we pull from the national map. We do quality checks, so the quality checks are taken care of a lot by our, our peer reviewers. And we have some daily automated checks that we run a nightly vandalism script, um, flag for a certain number of deletes. If there's, you know, if somebody's deleted a bunch of points, we get a flag, a little email on that saying, hey, check that person. Things like that. And publishing, publishing uh, the national map viewer and also our US Topo product. It's also available for download for GIS users. Marketing is the team that we use to help get the information out. The big part of, of we've had a lot of successes over the last year, and that's a, a good group. Part-timers helping out. Social media. And we do follow, it follows the same power law distribution that's, that this was, this came up with the study with OpenStreetMap and our VGI product, or uh, project follows that same that same line. And some of the results, you can see that uh, these are our news releases and top stories on USGS's website, so how we've grown over the last year. The flat spot was the furlough. All right, I'll turn it over. Mikkel. So uh, Mulabi is a collaborative mapping project focused on the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, looking at um, forest monitoring and natural resource extraction. It's the second largest intact rainforest after the Amazon of um, somewhat unknowable importance to global climate, has been the site of conflict for decades, but in recent years, um, increasingly peaceful and stable uh, which also means that this intact forest and the perhaps vast mineral and oil resources under it are um, now more amenable to extraction. Um, so if you are interested in preserving these forests, there is quite a uh, complicated picture emerging. And you have a lot of data out there. Some of it is national scale held with the government. Some of it is on the ground in communities. This is a, a photograph from a, a community mapping um, project that Moabi undertook with the Excites program out of UCL, Luki Hackey's group, working with Baca Pygmy communities to collect data um, on deforestation and forest use um, in, in the middle of the forest. And they are disconnected uh, for the foreseeable future, meaning you're not going to have any um, network, um, nor are you necessarily going to even have um, literate people, and you need to collect um, information on both that micro scale and, on, and in the macro scale. Um, so that's the kind of user that we need to serve, as well as serving very high-end GIS 
type uh, users. Uh, this is a blurry uh, picture of the office of OSFAC in Kinshasa. They're a very skilled traditional GIS and remote sensing shop that we partner with. And um, they have their ways of doing things, which is very different from the OpenStreetMap uh, way of doing things. And so we also have to adapt um, the very technical side of making what we do within the OpenStreetMap stack um, understandable to them. We have a pretty complex data environment. Data is held by government ministries, uh, by um, NGOs, by the community. Um, there's not, there are some places that aggregate all of that data together in order to get a comprehensive picture of what's happening to the forest in DRC, but it's very hard to have a discussion and a collaboration around that data. Um, and so that's the point of the discussion, like this data set is of this quality or actually they're updating it, all happens very ad hoc within silos and that's exactly the kind of problem that OpenStreetMap aims to solve, a common place where everyone can gravitate and actually figure out what is the true data picture of what's going on. This is the second iteration of Moabi. We have the, the first iteration was developed at the World Wildlife Fund and back in 2009 and it was at a point where I would not have suggested using the OpenStreetMap infrastructure because it was not nearly as easy to um, deploy and to change. Um, they developed what I think was something ahead of its time with a lot of the features that we come to know in OpenStreetMap with collaborative editing, revision history, um, you know, data as a social object. Um, but it was built on what is now kind of obsolete technology of uh, Drupal version 6 and it was not a, um, a starting point to continue with. This is kind of a developer community that's, that's um, disappeared. Um, and there was a lot of questions about the usability and really reflecting the architecture of participation because 90% of the people who are going to be involved with what Moabi is doing are not going to go in and edit data or even really do anything complex with it. They just want to access maps that tell the stories that they want to read or want to use in reports or for whatever purpose that they have. So how do you address something which is um, the map as a social object which can be shared and discussed easily and also serve that 10% of people who are ready to get di uh, dig into data? So we have been looking at the entire uh, just taking time, entire workflow of OpenStreetMap from you know, data imports, defining um, tag structures, editing, and then um, distributing tiles and publishing. And have started just, to, just this year to focus on particular points where we think we can make the strongest contribution in the, you know, with the least amount of effort, the low, low hanging fruit. One of the first things we were thinking about is tagging. Um, tagging is the amazing secret power of OpenStreetMap because you can represent pretty much anything. But in order to be part of that discussion, you have to join the tagging email list. You have to edit wiki pages where the votes may or may not actually have any reality to them. You need to edit um, JOSM presets or if you're defining presets for ID, you have to edit a JSON file and recompile ID. Um, then in order to render it, there's another step. So we want to try to bring a little bit of um, cohesiveness to that. And we started with a built-in preset editor to ID. So we're still wrapping our heads. Uh, Sajad, who's here, has uh, been doing amazing work with the ID editor, trying to um, get it to do new things. And so we have an API um, on the Rails app, which stores presets. And built in within ID is an editor where you can set up um, the, tag, the fields that are associated with a feature. Um, and there's other changes that we had to make, like the ability to edit very large objects um, at, very, at a, like a low zoom level. An oil concession is huge, and you want to be able to edit that in one screen, and that's the kind of thing you can't just tweak one, um, the like zoom level uh, where ID allows you to edit. You have to do some, some changes. Um, I was listening very um, carefully and with much interest to the talks next door. Um, in the last block of presentations on vector tiles and ways of managing um, rendering, we've adopted uh, this. 
We have a cartographer, James, who should be around. Um, he manage, he designs tiles for all the feature sets on his desktop. He uses, we use GitHub to share those, so he actually checks those into GitHub. Then on the server, James can just run a fabric script to add that tile set to an API. So we have an API on the Rails app, which is used for storing details about each tile layer. And that configures the Rails app, and then it configures our tile server. So the list of uh, map layers on the right is entirely from the database. Um, and um, we've been experimenting, I've been experimenting with mod tile, trying to get it to do UTF grid. Uh, I got very frustrated with uh, wrapping my head around C++ again and gave up and have used tile stash and so far so good for that part. But um, this is definitely uh, something to discuss more. And what we're calling a map story, um, this idea is once you've created a set of tiles, how do you easily create a really beautiful website around that data? That's actually ultimately the point. It's not about, it's great to have all that data, but what are you gonna communicate with it? So this is a communication tool um, built into the Rails app tied to groups in OpenStreetMap. So there's a, there's a, um, a, tree, there's a branch of OpenStreetMap in the OSM Lab GitHub repository which has groups and a group can work collectively on a map story which consists of um, another a number of form fields. You choose your tiles, um, you set your map views for different sections of the site, you put in text, and then it generates um, a post in Jekyll, uh, in a Jekyll site. And this is, uh, this is kind of our preview site. We're still working on things, hoping to get everything launched by Earth Day. Um, but this site was generated from that form. Um, there's a number of sections which provide different views into the map so you can, this is kind of a, a view of all of DRC mining concessions. You page down and it will show you, um, you know, the details of what was collected at a community map and maybe show some different layers. And there's a data side to this that allows export so you can customize your layers and your view and then you get an embed or um, links to download the data. So it is uh, about transparency and reuse of data in open data projects. So if you want to do something more than tell the story, if you want to really grab into the data, the idea is we're a sharing point as well. So from our uh, few months working with the OpenStreetMap stack, we found that it, it works to do different things uh, for sure. Um, it adapts well. Uh, when you want to do more structured things um, and less open, which kind of, if you discuss that with, with folks in the OpenStreetMap community, there's a bit of a visceral, uh, you know, QA, different le access levels. Well, in some domains, you really have to have people who are able to validate and say, yes, that is correct. Otherwise, it's not going to be um, acceptable results. So we have, we've tested like, permissions model, I think that's something to expand on. Um, and basically, well, we found there's a lot more work to do. If you're a newcomer to OpenStreetMap and don't have the, the opportunity to come to a state of the map to learn all about OpenStreetMap, then um, there's, a lot of, there's been a lot of usability work on the website and on the ID editor, but on the entire workflow from, say, importing data to defining um, tag structures to actually publishing, um, there's a lot of interest in usability questions that we're um, also starting to grapple with. Um, our collective desires, uh, I think coming out of the USGS and Moabi project, um, we both really want a mobile application, but it's hard to know where to start. There's no um, open source mobile editor or viewer for OpenStreetMap, which would I say, yes, that's, a cent that's where we're going to develop. So if that center of gravity is already there, please tell us. But it would be good to think about what is the collective project there. Uh, making the editors more flexible, say to multiple databases and allowing synchronization and sharing back with OpenStreetMap in an easy way would be, would be interesting. Integrating QA more into the application itself, like the USGS showed with multiple editors, but then say setting data targets or the ability to 
monitor easily what's happening with a particular data layer in a particular place. Um, some of these tools exist outside of the main website, but I think it's really important to bring it all into one cohesive place if you're bringing lots of newcomers to, uh, to your project there. Better packaging of the stack components, it's still kind of hard to deploy, uh, so Jad will speak, <laughs> speak to that. Um, permissions models and yeah, more research into usability. So that's the, that's the vision, is that this is a choice for people out there who want to collaborate on geodata. This is a really, vi make it really viable choice and easy to use that can adopt other participation models which are somewhat less open if needed and collaboratively work on the code base, especially the OpenStreetMap website, which could, I think could do a whole lot more than it's um, doing now, but uh, of course doing well. Um, well. We'll all be at the sprint day. Uh, Sajad, myself, and James, and Leo, the leader of the project, will be at the Red Cross tomorrow. So we hope that this is maybe some fodder for discussions or even, even hacking tomorrow. Thank you.